today's passage from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring a charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies? Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to a slaughter. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. On Wednesday of this week, Reverend Billy Graham, a great soldier in the kingdom of God, went to his eternal reward. In honor of his memory, I'd like to begin with a story that Billy Graham once told. Mr. Graham gave a sermon once about victory. And he began the sermon by talking about the English cuckoo bird. The cuckoo bird does not build a nest. Instead, it waits for another bird to leave its nest and then goes and lays an egg in that nest. And when the mother bird returns, not very good at math, and so she doesn't realize there's an extra <laughs> egg in her nest. And she'll sit on her four little eggs and on the one large cuckoo egg. Well, eventually all those eggs hatch, and the mother bird will go out to get them food. And when it comes back, it will find four little mouths and one big mouth. <laughs> Guess who gets the food? Well, that cuckoo bird will grow very quickly, and eventually it will push the other birds out of the nest. Then the cuckoo bird gets all the food, and its appetite is insatiable. Mr. Graham said that when we are saved by grace and begin to live a life of grace, we face severe opposition. Sin, like a cuckoo bird, has an insatiable appetite and it wants to push everything else out of our lives. But Mr. Graham said, we have victory because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. The Winter Olympics have ended for the year. They finished the closing ceremony about three hours ago. And so today I want to finish up this series on the Olympics. Two weeks ago we talked about training for, the, for our spiritual race and how we train our souls. Last week we talked about competition, how we run this Christian race. Today I want to talk about where all that leads. Today I want to talk about victory. Because... The Christian race is not something we simply run for the sake of running. We run towards victory. In 1 Corinthians, Paul wrote, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like someone beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I might not myself be disqualified from the prize. When we chase after the Christian race, when we run this Christian race, we are running for victory. Vince Lombard, sometimes considered the greatest football coach in history, once said, winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. I don't know that's quite the right sentiment for the Christian race. Because Lombardi was talking about sports. And he was saying that in sports, it doesn't matter how you play the game. It doesn't matter if you enjoy the game. It just matters if you win. That's not really what the Christian life is about. Yes, victory in Christ matters, but the Christian life is a life of joy. If our life is not filled with joy in our Christian walk, we're probably doing it wrong. I think perhaps a better quote comes from General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur was once asked, what is the most important message you can give to a new military cadet? 
MacArthur responded, there's no substitute for victory. I think there's a lot of truth there. In the Christian walk, there is no substitute for victory. Christ has called us on to victory. Now, I said this is the last week we're going to talk about the Olympics, so I do want to say something. I enjoy sports. I like to play. I like basketball and volleyball and racquetball and about a dozen, dozen other sports. I enjoy to play the games. And I think that our God is pleased when we enjoy good things. I think there's more value to sports than just the enjoyment of the game. I think there are lessons in sports. We learn physical values. Now they keep our bodies in good shape. We start learn social values. They, have, they teach us teamwork. We also learn spiritual values. Because in sports, there is a winner and a loser. A famous line from the old show, The Wild Wo Wide World of Sports, is the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. In a sporting competition, there's a clear winner and a clear loser. But in soccer, I occasionally make fun of it because there's the pointlessness of a 0-0 tie. But most of the time, there is a clear-cut winner and loser in sports. Most of life is not like that. Most of life is rare to have a clear-cut victory or a clear-cut defeat. One of the values of sports is that it gives us this clear-cut victory or clear-cut defeat that helps us deal with the rest of life where things are less clear-cut. Even in our spiritual lives, it is rare for spiritual growth to include an all-out victory or an unqualified defeat. Usually there's some gray area in our growth. And yet Christ has called us to victory. We are called heavenward to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. But sometimes I wonder if that's something preachers say that doesn't make a lot of sense, really. I mean, what does victory in Christ look like right now? Because we are called to victory. In Romans, Paul wrote that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. A conqueror wins a battle. A conqueror is victorious. But Paul wrote we are more than conquerors. We have more than just a victory. We've won without playing. We have won because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. He has gained us victory. He has overcome the world, and so we are victorious. Not only that, Paul says nothing can take away this victory. There's nothing on earth, no human force, no force of nature that can undo this victory. There is no angel in heaven or demon in hell that can harm this victory. Even death itself can do nothing against this victory because death has been overcome. God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, has brought us this victory. Who can compete with that? But I think this brings me back to the point I made earlier. What does this victory look like? In our lives right now, how do we know that we're winning? What is victory in Christ in our lives today? We're another preacher by the name of James Merritt said that there are three aspects to our victory. He said that there are three tenses to the victory. There's the past, the present, and the future. And I want to talk about these three tenses to our victory. First is the past. First, we are saved from the penalty of sin. This is in the past. This has already happened. We are already saved from the penalty of sin. This work was done by Jesus on the cross. This work was brought to us personally when we put our faith in him, when we turn to Christ in repentance and faith and obedience. We are saved from the penalty of sin. Because Paul wrote, the wages of sin are death. Death is in this world because of sin, and the sting of death is sin. But Christ has saved us from that penalty still face physical death, but we have a life beyond this world. Death has been overcome, and we are saved from the penalty of sin. But that's just the beginning. Beyond that, we have a victory right now. We are saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. At this moment, God is at work saving us from the power of sin. Now, this is not a 
finished victory. We are still running this race. Sin is still a reality in this world. But we are being saved from the power of sin, both to our good and for the glory of God. I like to sing. I think if anyone here has ever heard me sing, you know I'm not very good at it. But I enjoy to sing. Uh, and happily, I've got a five-year-old daughter who has not yet realized how bad of a singer I am. So I still get to sing to her sometimes. And despite my complete lack of rhythm or tone, I know a lot of songs. I know the lyrics to a wide variety of songs, so I can sing all kinds of different things to Perry. My father also cannot sing. I'm told that when I was an infant, of course, he sang to me. Unlike me, my dad knows one song. <laughs> Literally, he knows the words to one song. And obviously, I don't remember this, but I'm told when I was a child, he would sing this one song over to me <clears throat> again and again and again. The song is called The, the House of the Rising Sun. <laughs> it, if you don't know that song, you have to look it up later. I'm not going to describe it. <laughs> if you do know that song, it probably tells you a lot about me. <laughs> I bring this up because there's a line in the House of the Rising Sun that I think really stands out to me. The line is, mothers, tell your sons not to do the things I've done. Spend your lives in sin and misery in the House of the Rising Sun. And I like that line because it speaks some truth there. Sin and misery go together. The temptation of sin is that we think it's something we want, when in reality it just brings misery in our lives. The big lie of sin is that it will make us happy. But the truth is that sin, sin just destroys happiness and brings misery to us. At best, sin is something we will enjoy for the moment, but then find suffering from it in the long term. I think most of the time we don't even enjoy sin as we're doing it. It's something we just try to convince ourselves that we want. But in reality, we can see the pain and misery it is bringing into our lives but we are being saved from the power of sin. The theological word for this is sanctification. We are being made holy before God. Our God is at work right now, destroying the power of sin in our lives. Now, we are still in this race. It is not over yet, and so we do not have that final crown. But our God is at work. Sin is being defeated. And the victory of Christ in our lives right now is as we seek Him, we find ourselves being more and more sanctified. We find our way, ourselves turning away from sin at deeper and deeper levels and seeking the truth of God in our lives. So, we have been saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. Third and finally, we will be saved from the presence of sin. This is for the future. The time will come when we will be saved entirely from sin. Right now we see sin in our lives and in the world around us. But the power of God is that we will be saved from the presence of sin. It will be gone from our lives. It will be gone from the world around us. People often ask what heaven will be like. That can be a difficult question to answer. I think the secular world depicts heaven as kind of a wish fulfillment where someone can get whatever they want or whatever they desire. That's not really a biblical view of heaven. Most of the time, the Bible describes heaven by what will not be there. Imagine it this way. Imagine you met a person who had lived his entire life on a frozen tundra. He had never known anything but that. Now try imagining how you would describe to that person what a tropical beach is like. How do you describe the feeling of warm, wet sand between your toes to someone who has only known freezing snow? How do you describe a cool breeze to someone who's only known an Arctic blast? I think a lot of what we would do is tell people what is not there. That is, there is no cold. There is no snow, there is no ice, there is no frigid temperatures. That is a world entirely different from an icy plain. And that's a lot of how the Bible describes heaven. It is a place that is different from earth. To describe heaven to those who have only known earth, the Bible tells us we will not be there. There will be no death. There will be no pain. There will be no suffering. There will be no sin. 
Sin will finally and fully be destroyed. We will not have sin in our lives, and we will not have it in the world around us. We won't struggle with sin in our lives. We will no longer have to fight with ourselves to do the right thing. Rather, sin will lose its place. The corruption of sin that affects every life will finally be cleaned away. And sin will no longer have its place in the world around us. The suffering and the wounds brought to this world by sin will finally be healed. And this is the victory that we run for. We have already been saved from the penalty of sin, and we're being saved from the power of sin. The day will come when we are saved from the presence of sin. The sin will no longer be in our lives or in the world around us. And so we run. We train for this spiritual race. We run this spiritual race because we have a victory in sight. In a world of hopelessness, we have been given hope. In a world of death, we have been offered abundant life. In a world of sin, we have been offered new holiness. And in a world of defeat, we have been called to victory. Amen. Amen. In a moment, we're going to stand to sing our invitation hymn. And as we stand to sing, if you need that victory, if you need to begin a relationship with Christ, if you need to be freed from the penalty of sin, that is an option for you today. If you need to be freed from the power of sin in your life right now, if you need a new refreshment of the Spirit of God, this week, talk to myself, talk to one of the elders, or even right now, if you need to renew your relationship with him, you have an opportunity. Ask you'll stand with me now for invitation to him, which is faith is the victory, number 46, and we'll just sing the first verse.